and we open up a security dialogue. This will touch on the rally factor of the event, what they're trying to accomplish, and just clearly briefly explain the how factor, the rules of the discussion. Okay, the rally factor, or what they're trying to accomplish today and tomorrow. The security dialogue series is part of a larger set of filming, sending a set to Bozo, dedicated to taking the parts of the Europe, Atlantic, and Britain. More precisely, strong advice from the United States, strong advice from Canada, then for integration to EU, and ultimately the industry from the premier alliance of alliances NATO. That was first professed in 1999 to 2000 by both the executive and the larger side of branches of Ukraine's government. And was eventually passed. And endorsed in bipartisan fashion in the United States in 2000 to 2004 by the late Clinton administration and the early W. Bush administration. The first of the was started in 2005 in the wake of the armed revolution with all its marvelous goals, and the underlying and underscore the sincerity of Ukraine's real Atlantic professions. It set two key and co equal markers for all future security efforts. First, providing the death. Of each possible U.S. and Ukrainian bilateral cooperation and security members, and second, monitoring the pace of Ukraine's accession into the alliance. Interesting that we started the trouble 20 years ago. And in addition to the steps in regard to the first market by taking place to look at I-4, K-4, Iraq, and Afghanistan, where we participate, where the Ukrainians participated. It also reflected on a variety of UA NATO partnership endeavors and anticipated an offer of NATO membership action plan for Ukraine either in Riga in seven or in Bucharest in eight. The excitement was almost palatable at the time. Unfortunately, as everybody knows now, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut short everything that I'm about to say. Unfortunately, as everyone knows now, in the immense, the anticipated uh, moves were never made. The map office stalled first in Riga and then definitively. In, in Bucharest, when Putin famously convinced the U.S. leaders to say, yes, but not now. That disaster, if I can ed editorialize so boldly, was followed in 2010 by the coming to power of the Yanukovych regime, which in short order, uh, took NATO membership off the table and radically reduced EU membership goals. This initially put a halt to our security uh, uh, series and then produced three events three, four, and five that sought to see if there was anything salvageable with the Yanukovych. And ironically, it turns out it wasn't. And Ukraine knew it as well. So again, as we know, the events of 2013 to 14 brought seismic changes as big as those of the 2007 to 10 period in the history of the dialogue series. We went back to the discussion of the Euromaidan and the revolution of dignity emphatically reconnected the full bodied EU and NATO ambitions and indeed turned them into constitutional requirements in the Ukrainian constitution. It also brought back the issue of closer US Ukraine um, uh, bilateral defense and cooperation with a vengeance, but this time with a ra rather nasty twist. Russia, recognizing the glacial uh, shift that Ukraine had made in, um, after the uh, Euro Maidan events, took Ukraine to war, even if in its more, less formal and hybrid form, in the process creating not one but two conflict zones, Crimea and Donbass. That ended up being the discussion that we had in security dialogues six to 10, each taking out a fresh marker on which use that faced us in Crimea and Donbass. Sadly, last year, the rumors of war, a full-scale war, and ultimately a full-scale war, caught the attention of all preparing for the next SD gathering. That was last year's. And a lot of the members that you're going to be hearing, a lot of folks that you're going to be hearing are going to be uh, in a repeat of what happened at that time. It was run nine days after Russia's terrible fourth run in the region and was tasked to evaluate Ukraine's capacity to withstand the terrible strikes on its soil in six key dimensions, land, sea, coastal, air defense, um, air, air def and air defense, cyber capacity and counter capacity, information capacity and counter capacity, and military industrial resources. While cautiously optimistic after nine days because the Ukrainians seemed to be holding their own everywhere, the forum exhibited a somber mood, mood expecting more grief from Putin and his forces in the coming months. Ironically, anyhow, the grief that was anticipated in that dialogue materialized in the following months, but in much larger 
uh, doses that anticipated. Mariupol said with Donetsk, Luhansk may have been losses, but the Ukrainians armed with forces, armed forces scored a series of larger victories in the battles of Kiev, Chernihiv, Sumy, the sinking in Moskva, the land the sea drone attacks in Sevastopol, the recapture of the one oblast capital that had been lost last year. So here we are, and here I end, here we are again at Security Dialogue 15 to ask that big question, what next? And ponder a matter that might not have been as realistic last year. Does Ukraine have the capacity, especially with the added capabilities it's received from the West, to win this thing? To actually win this thing? And so given these interesting questions, I end this Y section very quickly to pass to the discussion section or the rules of the discussion. And simply for those that are going to be helping us with the rules of discussion, all highlight session presenters, which is our, our present guests, um, will have 15 minutes to provide the remarks or however long they do because they're extremely important to us. And then all the panel session presenters will have 12 to 15 minutes to to, um, to provide the remarks. All special discussions will have 10 to 12 minutes to provide their comments on the panels and presentations and add their own insight into the matters at hand. Okay, having said all this and having taken way too much time, I actually would like to now move on to our first session. It's always the, the sort of key session, it's the first word. And so I have two distinguished guests, both of whom, and I greatly honor because I've heard them speak before, and I've, <laughs> the first is, is, is Representative Higgins. I first met the good congressman in Buffalo. He, and I think it was State Senator Kennedy, appeared at the Buffalo um, Ukrainian Center to express their strong support for the Ukrainian nation in its time of great peril. What struck me, and I told you that at that point, uh, Representative Higgins, was your, your ability, his ability to speak on the issue of Ukraine and its needs, particularly in matters of defense, in serious detail without a stitch in notes. And uh, I, had, I had seen powerful Senate and House staff officers sometimes do comprehensive briefings that way, on, in, um, impromptu, but I not quite our legislators. I could be mistaken, but I left the event vowing that I would ask him to speak at an event <laughs> at any point in time in the future. So again, without further pause, I now ask <laughs> Representative Higgins to do exactly that, to give the first portion of the Ukrainian, of, of the first word at our conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And thank you very much, Walter, and I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I represent Buffalo, New York, and um, Niagara Falls, uh, Western New York. And uh, we have about 20,000 Ukrainians uh, living in Western New York, about 10,000 in the city, and then throughout the metropolitan area, uh, about 10,000 more. I just returned uh, from Europe. I was in Vienna, Austria. I was in uh, Rome, Italy, and uh, also uh, Prague uh, in the Czech Republic. We are traveling with a bipartisan group of members of Congress for the purpose of dealing with foreign ministers of all of those countries to ensure them that the United States commitment to Ukraine is long-term and solid for as long as it needs to be. What typically happens is in those countries uh, throughout Europe, uh, people are following you know, the American news. And when they see the debate, uh, people suggesting that there's Ukraine fatigue, that this is not an open check, they begin to get very, very nervous. And the United States commitment financially and otherwise is unprecedented. To date, we have committed $100 billion in both military and humanitarian aid uh, to the effort in Ukraine. So I just wanted to thank Walter uh, for the invitation to be here, I also want to recognize the members of the Western New York Ukrainian community who traveled to Washington, D.C. this week uh, to be with us, your commitment to helping displaced families, and your unwavering support uh, for friends and family back in Ukraine exemplifies the strength and the courage Ukrainians around the world have shown 
since and beginning this horrible war. My community of Western New York, as I mentioned, is home to 20,000 uh, Ukrainian people. In the initial days of the war, many of them joined me and Walter at the Ukrainian Cultural Center in downtown Buffalo to talk about how we collectively and as a government could support the Ukrainian effort. It is my hope that uh, they feel the same support today than they did at the beginning of this war just over a year ago. Ukraine, after one year, has exceeded all expectations. Uh, the army and the military were better prepared than anyone had anticipated. Early in the war, it was said that this is a special military operation. Russian generals were saying this would be a walk in the park. It was said that Russia was losing the war by not winning, and Ukraine was winning the war by not losing. Today, Ukraine has reclaimed 54% of the land Russia had captured since the beginning of the war. Russia currently controls about 18% of Ukraine. Ukraine today is entered, re-entered the city of Kherson, which Russia had controlled for nine months. The story is that well told about one of the major problems that were experienced today, and that is the occupied territories. It was always said at the beginning of this war by commentators that Putin was a rational actor. I categorically reject that. Uh, Putin is 70 years old. Uh, that is approximately the life expectancy of a male in Russia. Uh, he views himself as a modern day Peter the Great. He viewed the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the 15 republics as a great tragedy and vowed to reconcile the Soviet Union in a modern day form over which he would control and force. This, what we're finding now, there were 66,000 war crimes that have been reported in those territories since the war began. The number is exceeded, expected to double by the time that this whole effort is over. And the reports of torture, of murder, of rape, and the deportation of Ukrainian children to Russia. This is not about territory, it's not about land, it's about the atrocities being inflicted on the Ukrainian people by this mad dictator who is irrational by any measure. This is about the barbaric treatment of the Ukrainian people. This is also generational. President Zelensky is 45 years old. He's surrounded primarily by people in their 30s and 40s. Putin is 70 years old. What's happening in Russia today, all of the 30 and 40 year old tech savvy people that graduated from St. Petersburg and Moscow are leaving. They're leaving for Turkey, they're leaving for Europe, they're leaving for the United Arab Emirates. It's estimated to be about 500,000. The Russian population is decreasing, not increasing. Fundamentals for economic growth is an increased productive population, and that's not occurring. What's also happening in Russia today with all of these people leaving, families are divided. Their parents and grandparents stay in Russia. They don't have the means to fend for themselves and determine what is true and what is not from the propaganda that's being inflicted on them from their so-called leader of Russia. So families are apart. So 30 and 40 year olds who have left Russia, 30 and 40 year olds in Ukraine who are fighting for Ukraine's continued sovereignty. Uh, these are the dynamics that are playing out today. Throughout the past year, I have had plenty of opportunity uh, to 
observe President Zelensky, including a joint session of the United States Congress. Uh, he is humble, he is direct, and he is defiant. He has reaffirmed Ukraine's commitment, so long as we continue to support them, to win this very, very unjust war. And always remember, and it can't be said too frequently, that this was an unprovoked attack on a sovereign country. So his leadership has been extraordinary. The people of Ukraine have shown the world what courage and perseverance and commitment to country means. Democracy is hard work. Citizenship is a team sport. And I would say to you that Americans who have become somewhat ambivalent about our democratic tradition that leads the world needed to be reminded by the courageous president of Ukraine, the courageous people, what democracy is really about and how hard and fragile it can be. Since day one, the United States and its allies have stood with Ukraine, their sovereignty and their democracy, and we will continue to support them. We will support you with military and security assistance and humanitarian aid, the resources you need to defend freedom and democracy. Vladimir Putin has made clear that he never accepted the dissolution of the Soviet Union. In fact, it is something that he seeks to recreate. He has targeted schools, hospitals, killing innocent people and children caught in the path of his merciless attacks, not a rational actor. There is no doubt that the actions he has taken against the people of Ukraine are war crimes, and he must be charged by the international community consistent with the Geneva Conventions of 1949. At the beginning of this unjustified war, we saw and feared that Ukraine was a stepping stone toward a greater control of Europe. Ukraine should be allowed to join NATO. The driving principle of NATO is Article 5. An attack on one is an attack on all. Article 5 was established to keep from Soviet and now Russian aggression in the region. It needs to be invoked. It needs to be stronger. The members of the European Union have come a long way. At the beginning of this, some were saying that the European Union was obsolete, that they were thinking about withdrawing. That's no longer happening because this war has served to coalesce that effort, that principle, that vision behind the effort to defend democracy in that part of the world and uh, throughout the larger world. Um, today, Kyiv still stands and the bonds with our allies have never been stronger. But st there's still much at stake with this war. A loss for Ukraine means a loss for democracy. The United States and its allies will always defend democracy and we are committed to standing with Ukraine as long as it takes. With that, do we have the ambassador here? Oh, um, we have the oh okay. Deputy, deputy, uh... Chief Chief Sir, you're next. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Congressman, for your remarks. And thank you, Dr. Zaritsky, for organizing this event and for or these events over many, many years in support of Ukraine. It's my honor and, and privilege to be here on behalf of Ambassador Markarova and the Embassy of Ukraine. Uh, on February 24th, we marked uh, one year of Ukraine's resistance against uh, full-scale Russian aggression. Uh, Russia is 28 times bigger than Ukraine, and it threw all its military might against our country. And Russian propaganda was saying that Ukraine will fall in a matter of three days, yet it's been over 365 days, and we're still standing, and we're st standing strong. Um, 
uh, two days ago, we also marked uh, the official day of resistance to the occupation of Crimea, which started in 2014. So this war, in fact, uh, is going on not just for one year, but for nine years in a row. Um, uh, this war has brought death and devastation of unthinkable proportions to Ukraine that we haven't seen uh, since World War II. The Russians cannot win us on the battlefield, so they resort to the tactics of attacking, like Congressman said, our civilians, our cities, our hospitals and schools, uh, our peaceful infrastructure. Uh, but uh, Russia's actions did not break our spirit, but only made us stronger. And we know at this time that we will fight and we will win. We are determined to do so. Um, this war is not about Ukraine, it's about all the values and principles that we all stand for, the most fundamental rules of international law, uh, and the values that uh, our countries share. And the world has united around Ukraine. The uh, uh, last uh, week's uh, vote at the United Nations resolution in support of Ukraine and condemning Russian aggression with uh, 141 uh, votes uh, is another proof of that. And the um, leader of this support is, of course, the United States of America. I would like to thank um, the uh, Congress, and the administration, and all American people for the tremendous support that Ukraine has received over this uh, past year. This support has been instrumental for Ukraine in holding our ground and defending our land. Uh, we have a clear uh, path and, and clear vision how we want to move forward. And this vision uh, is described in President Zelensky's 10-point uh, peace plan that he presented last year. But the key point uh, uh, in that peace plan is Ukraine's victory on the battlefield, on the battleground. Um, our army is stronger. Um, our army has been modified uh, and changing in accordance to NATO standards for uh, many years, and the war has made our army stronger. Uh, but the key point, as Dr. Zuritsky said, is do we have the capacity to win this thing? We have the strength, we have the resolve and determination to fight and to win. But the key for us is to uh, have the capacity and the tools to, to finish this job. So we need more weapons. Uh, and uh, the sooner and the more security assistance Ukraine gets, the sooner the war will end with comprehensive, just and lasting peace. Uh, neither Ukraine nor anybody else is interested in a protracted war of attrition that will increase casualties and demand additional resources. Um, President Zelensky's diplomatic team had one clear goal uh, since last year, to unlock political decisions on the so-called Big Seven of weapons. Uh, we've managed to unlock six of them, anti-tank arms, artillery, MLRS, air defense, uh, tanks, and long-range missiles. Uh, we are convinced that we will uh, soon be able to unlock the seventh type, fighter jets, uh, which are critical to protect Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian skies and for us to um, have an advantage over the occupying force and for us to liberate the land. Um, uh, as Congressman said, you know, we have uh, shown uh, that we can win. We have um, liberated uh, more than half of the territory that was captured by the Russians since February. We just need additional uh, edge, additional advantage to finish the job and to liberate uh, Ukraine completely. There's no other way to end Russia's military threat uh, to its neighbors and, and, and the world uh, than to defeat it on the battlefield uh, in Ukraine. And um, as was said, uh, every Russian war criminal uh, must be punished for the crimes that they have committed, for the war crimes and crimes of genocide. Uh, and we are also working with our uh, allies and partners to create a special tribunal that will hold the Russian leadership accountable for the crime of aggression that they have committed. So uh, we uh, appreciate all the support that has been given, and we need more support from the uh, Congress, from the administration, in terms of weapons, in terms of uh, tougher sanctions and economic assistance. And uh, what's important, we have been uh, fully transparent and accountable for every dollar uh, uh, from uh, US taxpayers that uh, Ukraine has received and has, has spent. Uh, uh, Ukraine's victory is critical for European and global security. Uh, thank you for your solidarity, for standing with Ukraine, for your continued support. And uh, by joining our efforts, we, we will win. Thank you, Dr. Zrizki, for organizing this conference. I wish you a very productive discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, 
Congressman, I, I was going to say that uh, you're you're you've been joined by someone I deeply respect. Um, DCM Rashuk uh, is like his friend Mr. Prostyko, who had his position as DCM and eventually became foreign minister. Uh, Mr. Prashuk is an extremely talented and veteran uh, Ukrainian diplomat, and I always appreciate when uh, when he comes to, to our events. I actually um, would ask um, if you would stay for five five minutes and possibly field questions. I have a question of my own uh, as moderator. I should ask first, but I think I'm going to ask the audience, um, <laughs> Mr. Altman and and Mr. Sheeran. Mr. Alton. Um, can you talk about the discussions that uh, Ukraine's had with the U.S. about the attack on the ground? Well, like I said, we, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we need a mic. Do we have a mic? Yes. Uh, yes, we need someone who always walks around with Mike, one of our interns. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So the yeah. I think it's on. Can you hear me? So the, the question is, can you talk about the discussions that you've had with the U.S. about the Army tactical missile systems, probably one of the last big pieces of, of armament that Ukraine's been asking for that haven't gotten yet? There was some indication that there weren't enough to go around. Can, can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, attackums and long-range missiles are a subject of um, our discussion with the U.S. administration, with the Pentagon. Uh, but I would like to note that uh, the assistance that the U.S. has been providing has been on the ascending trajectory. You know, if we look at the beginning of the war in February, you know, we talked about uh, javelins, we talked about man pads. Um, uh, now we're talking about fighter jets and long-range uh, missiles, you know, because... Um, at first, perhaps there were doubts whether Ukraine could win. Now there's no doubt uh, among ourselves and the allies that we will win and we just need the tools to do the job. So attackums is part of the active discussion and um, we hope to receive. But have you been told that there's not enough to go around that accurate? Um, I wouldn't want to comment on the specifics uh, of what we talk with the Pentagon, but uh, the U.S. has been instrumental in providing us everything we need, and we hope that the U.S. will provide even more. I just uh, want to, this is an inquiry. He's probably one of the finest veteran <laughs> journalists around, Mr. Mr. Altman. That's why you had to ask the question. Um, Mr. Um, I, um, I will be 72 in May, <laughs> and I don't believe I am the reincarnation of Peter the Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't always believe I'm rational either, but with respect, Congressman, I believe that Putin is rational. He is not part of our ethical system. Right. Russia today is not part of our ethical system. That doesn't mean it is irrational. I do not believe, and I think it's important the administration not believe, that Vladimir Putin will undertake any action that he believes will fail. If he believes he will succeed, there he will have no moral taboos at all. And any hesitancy and weakness enhances his perception of the likelihood of success. That's the um, danger. If we believe he's irrational, we think we, we, we will begin, as some people do at very prominent places in Washington, believe that he will do mad and dangerous uh, things. And I uh, see it's not in his DNA to do to behave that way. Right, and, that's, interesting. Anyway, that's more of a comment. Than yeah, a yeah, but, 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 thank you. but an astute comment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, I'm going to ask one question because we have, we, it's time. Breedlove, I guess. Oh, then even better. <laughs> that's that's yes. I, I defer to General Breedlove. Well, first of all, thanks for letting me barge into the Q and A period. I want to thank both speakers immensely for their remarks, Congressman. I was 
particularly pleased with the way you you used the phrase Hybrid, that we should support of our conference. You, you yes. should. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Should I try again? Try now. Try now. How do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you, gentlemen. Thank you. Great. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for your remarks, both of you. I really appreciated them. Congressman, I really appreciated a phrase you used, which was that we need to support Ukraine to win. May I just observe that our government is not saying that uh, at the highest policy levels. They continue to say we're going to be there for as long as it takes or we will give them whatever it takes. But those sentences to a military commander are incomplete. The descriptors after that are important as long as it takes to win or to give them as much as it takes to win, like you said. Sir, can you comment a bit about why our government at the highest levels is reticent to, to finish those sentences in a way that would give us the right decision-making capability? Thank you, sir, for your time. Well, General, I would say that whatever it takes to me means whatever it takes to win. You don't enter involvement uh, to the extent that the United States has here, committing $100 billion thus far to lose or fall short of that. I don't know, you know, and I think this is why this piece of the, the war crimes mm. estimated to be 66,000 today, and we only discover this when we reclaim land that was previously taken. And estimated to be a hundred thousand. Where do you begin a negotiation with that? We are too far into this to accept anything other than a full Ukrainian victory. To to control their own land, because the one thing you know about Vladimir Putin, and I would re-establish that I don't think he's a rational actor is this is not uh, somewhere where he's going to stop if he's successful. And all indications were that Russia was militarily superior. They have more nuclear weapons than any country on earth. Mm. Um, I think that this is an individual who is isolated uh, I do not think he's rational, as I said before, and I think he, based on what he's already done in those areas that Russia took over and now that Ukraine has reclaimed, is indicative of a madman. So I would say, I can only speak for myself, I'm a member of Congress, I have a voice and I have a vote. <laughs> and my voice and vote will be with Ukraine until they, Ukraine, wins this war of aggression that was unprovoked. Absolutely right. Thank you, sir. I was about to ask just that one last question, but I, I, I know the time is running um, short for both of you. No, go ahead. So, but I will ask that question uh, of both of you um, in terms of our Congress as, as it's now constituted. Uh, from either side, just short comments in terms of what you think the possibilities are of continued support of the kind that you're talking about, sir. I think they're very and good. Also, this, and this. I, but I think what goes on here, and you have to understand that there's obviously a lot of people mm -hmm. in the administration, in the Pentagon, mm -hmm. in the Congress uh, that are involved in this decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to ensure that our dollars are spent in the most efficient and effective way. To say that Ukraine is not going to receive something today doesn't mean they're not gonna receive it next week. And I think what is occurring here is there is an assessment on the ground as to what Ukraine needs and what they're capable of using. You know, there's a hundred tanks coming. Mm -hmm. 
uh, some of which will not be operational for a couple of months or more. Uh, these are the kinds of things that go into this assessment and I think contribute to what appears to be some equivocation. I do not believe that there's any equivocation as it relates to our responsibility as stated and demonstrated to Ukraine. If you look at the bar graph in the world as to who's contributing to this war, the United States is here and everybody else is about here. And I understand that, but the reality is that we are in this uh, to see this through its logical conclusion. And the logical conclusion is a full victory for the Ukrainian people and for the leadership of Ukraine. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, um, yeah, thank you, Congressman. Uh, um, we uh, appreciate all the support that has been provided and we count uh, that it will continue. Um, along the lines of what the general was saying, uh, we need to have a clear uh, vision of uh, our end game, our goal. If, if our goal is Ukraine's victory and Russia's defeat, uh, we need to identify the tools that are needed to achieve that goal accordingly. Uh, you know, and and so uh, we we count that U.S. assistance will be continuing and um, with hopefully uh, new supplemental. Uh, coming uh, this year uh, to provide additional tools. And this will be not just the investment into Ukraine, but it's investment into Ukraine as a future uh, NATO member, member of transatlantic <laughs> security architecture. Outstanding. Outstanding. <laughs> and the, the one thing I, I just want to, uh, this needs to be said because, you know, there are 435 members of Congress uh, of the House, and there are 100 members of the Senate. People are going to say different things at different times based on what it is they see, read, hear, and to them what they know. Um, you know, you've heard the word invoked, the word corruption. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that is very, very important relative to maintaining the support of the American people mm -hmm. for our contributions to this effort in Ukraine is making sure that there's some accountability because they may, people may not know of corruption, but because for whatever reason they don't support it, they're going to seek to undermine this effort. Okay. And I think President Zelensky uh, has demonstrated good faith uh, through his actions as it relates to uh, ridding. Uh, any elements of corruption that may exist. Mm -hmm. There's going to be corruption in any system, particularly when there's a lot of money involved, mm -hmm. particularly when a lot of things are happening very quickly, mm -hmm. particularly when there's an existential threat. Um, so I think a lot of this is, you know, really just trying to be cautious. Right. But I don't think that in any way, shape, or form is indicative of the United States not fully committing to what is necessary in order for Ukraine to succeed. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the okay. session. I, just, I, would I would like to just comment, you know, like mm -hmm. at this time at the time of war, there's zero tolerance for corruption in Ukraine. And, and Ukrainians have shown uh, several times that they want to live in a society that is free and free of corruption and democratic and during revolution, orange revolution and revolution of dignity. And uh, like especially now, uh, it's just, uh, like I said, zero tolerance for corruption because you're not just stealing uh, from the government. You're stealing, you know, from, uh, you're helping the enemy uh, that's fighting your country. Yeah, so uh, right. uh, we are determined to eradicate it completely and we're doing everything we can uh, to ensure complete uh, transparency um, of use of the money that we receive from the United States and all other countries. We have... Um, uh, established a very detailed reporting system. We, we provide detailed reports to the World Bank, to the USAID, and to the U.S. Congress. And uh, we use uh, the uh, big four uh, financial companies, auditing companies, to audit all our spending. So this this is something that we uh, take very seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, for both both of you, for this wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, 
I know that I've um, moved to Mark and I saw Ambassador uh, Herbst <laughs> marking me that uh, uh, scolding me, but I would ask um, Ambassador Herbst and I would ask uh, Mr. Altman because they're here live and then we are going to be tuning in um, to individuals, uh, Mr. Zahoda Duke, um, former Minister Zahoda Duke and, uh, and uh, General Hodges and they will be on the screen. Yes, Andre, do we have them? Okay. Yes, please, please, Ambassador. And Mr. Olsen. Yes, yes. And we have the two in front of the uh, screen there. And I, um, I think um, Ambassador uh, John Herbst is so iconic that uh, it's when you say you don't have to really introduce him. Um, I actually um, have named the the individuals that we have at the panel. The panel, this first the discussion session will be assessing Ukraine's land force capabilities and needs. And I couldn't leave it in better hands than the ambassadors. What's that? Ambassador. Okay, thanks. Ambassador, oh. this is all yours now. Oh. Our first session. Oh, it's on. Good. Uh, I think you meant ironic rather than iconic. Uh, look, we, we, we've got a we've got a great panel here, uh, and two of us are on 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 site, two on the screen. Uh, we're going to give our first word to my colleague here, and then we'll bring in our our um, Zoom participants, please. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much, investors. Hi, Howard Altman, um, Port for the War Zone. Um, Today's discussion is about Ukraine's land capabilities and needs. And I want to talk a little bit about the iterative um, addition to Ukraine's capabilities from the U.S. And, and allies. But I want to start with a conversation that I had back in November of 2021. Uh, I met a young, at least young, compared to U.S. Uh, general officers named Kirill Budanov, who's the head of the Defense uh, Intelligence Director at the Gore. And we sat down in a lobby of a, of a hotel in Washington, not too far from here, with a map. And he laid out a pretty spot on um, estimate of what the Russians would do. Uh, he, he was within you know several weeks of when they would do this. And he talked about attacks from, from the east, from the north through Belarus, from the south. Uh, 1,600 artillery pieces they had massed, 330 aircraft, uh, 40 battalion tactical groups that would attack the Ukraine in a way that, that hadn't been seen over the, the course of what's been going on since 2014. Um, turned out to be huge. It was very spot on. But he, he also, we, we talked about what Ukraine needed to defend itself, and he knew he knew it was coming. He knew that this would be a, a war where the Russians would be using a lot of uh, missiles and, and rockets and drones. So the first thing he asked for was uh, Patriots, as well as the CRAM uh, system to, to, to defeat um, uh, Russian uh, aviation and Russian missiles. Um, one thing we didn't talk about, though, was how Ukraine would, would actually run two counteroffensives uh, later on in, uh, in uh, Kharkiv and in Kherson, and, and how it would be able to sustain itself uh, over the course of, you know, a year later after what he laid out uh, took place. Um, but this this discussion about what Ukraine needed was not the, not the first I had uh, with Ukrainian officials. The first time I talked about this was back in, in 2014, uh, in August of 2014, with uh, Colonel uh, Vitaly Nizola, who was the U Ukrainian representative to the CENTCOM uh, coalition at the time. The Ukrainians were extremely helpful in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and he talked about how this is, is a very difficult fight. The Netsk was about to fall, um, that he asked for um, ADH, he asked for um, uh, satellite imagery, he asked for intelligence, and he asked for um, anti-tank weapons. Um, aviation rotary, uh, fixed wing af aircraft, aviation fuel, and uh, as well as vehicles. So this is a discussion that's been going on for, for quite a while. Fast forward to uh, May of, of 2018, and I, I met up with um, 
uh, Roman Moshevitz, who's now the, the deputy head of the office of the president and somebody I've known for a while. Um, we walked the floor at the special operations conference in, in Tampa. This is a, where they have all kinds of weapon systems and uh, it was a special ops so there wasn't a big artillery or, or tanks. He walked around and said, oh, Howard, we need this and how, you know, this. And he, he looked at uh, things like um, robots that would um, be able to uh, rig up mines and detect mines. He looked at um, he looked at um, a, a sniper system screen that that you could you could use on a tablet so that they would have a problem with Russians lasing the scopes so that you, you, you could mitigate that. And, and but the reality of the situation really came when we went to Textron had a a drone called the Night Warden and it could provide ISR as well as strike. And the representative from Textron said, look, we, we can't give this to you right now. This was just about uh, five months after the first uh, agreement the U.S. had under the Trump administration to provide javelins uh, to Ukraine. That was a four-year, it was a three-year debate. As you know, 2014, the Congress asked the president at the time, Obama, to provide direct support of javelins. Um, and, and that didn't happen. It, it took a while. Um, so now what we're seeing is is the um, the unfolding is as the deputy chief of mission talked about this, this things gradually unlocking. Uh, in in um, January, as as hundred thousand so, the Russian forces were arrayed around Ukraine. U.S. had uh, gave another tranche of, of weapons of, of javelins to to Ukraine. I had another conversation with uh, General Badanov. And he told me that, again, U.S. needed uh, patriots. This was on February 28th, a year ago today. Um, also that day, Congress had uh, finally approved, the, the administration finally approved the uh, procurement of stingers to Ukraine. As you saw in the beginning of the war, the stingers and the javelins proved quite effective in, in uh, tackling uh, Russian armor and Russian aviation um, and, and helped uh, forestall the, the, the drive down through to, towards Kiev. Uh, as well as elsewhere, um, and continued debate about weapons in in April. The first tranche of howitzers were approved for uh, Ukraine. Uh, those are weapons that, that Ukrainians have, have been asking for for a while now. To be able to provide uh, you know fires in in the battlefield. Now it's about 160 of them, well over a million rounds of of um, howitzer ammunition just from the U.S. Um, we saw in, in later that the um, um, there were there were you know additional additional weapons that were sent to, to Ukraine in, in June. Finally, the approval of the HIMARS first delivery in, to Ukraine about uh, July. That proved to be a game changer to have a, a an accurate um, artillery system that uh, MLR system that can provide fires up to about forty five miles that helped Ukraine, obviously, with in, in both of those um, uh, counter offenses by able to, you know, hitting Russian uh, logistics depots far behind the lines, um, that, was a, that was a big game changer, obviously. And then um, later came the, uh, the, the Patriots, finally, in, in December, along with the uh, JDAM uh, extended range munitions, which uh, another great capability. Um, they they uh, have about the same range as, as the Gimler's munitions for the the HIMARS, but um, uh, um, I'm saying they have the same range as, as the uh, javelins, but a, a warhead that's about ten times as as, uh, as large. So that's those are these are all weapon systems that have been uh, uh, very helpful. Then came the the big tank debate uh, that that went on for a long time. And even a week before the U.S. finally decided to sign off on the Abrams. Um, Undersecretary for uh, Policy Call quoted um, Secretary of Defense Austin saying that you, you know Ukraine can't afford these, can't fuel them, um, can't sustain them. A week later, the agreement came um, with Germany because that was obviously a, a, a very big uh, debate. The Germans have the uh, uh, export licenses for some 2,000 um, uh, Leopard 2 tanks. That agreement came and unlocked. A, 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 you know, many other nations have, have worked to contribute. Um, 
the, the tanks, the, uh, Britain provided Challenger tanks. That the, the the first Leopards arrived last week, um, and now the, sort of the last two pieces of the puzzle, as the uh, uh, chief deputy chief of mission talked about, were the Attackums. Um, these are a weapon that can reach uh, about 200 miles. The uh, administration is yet to sign off on these uh, weapons. Um, that um, one one reason they've been given is that there's only about 4,000 of them, not enough to uh, provide for Ukraine. That remains to be seen. Also, there's a, a, a concern remains about antagonizing Russia. Um, I'm not sure how much more that can be antagonized. Um, the um, and and it, it again it remains to be seen whether that's going to be provided. Uh, and then the F-16s uh, again. Um, and that's something that'll be probably discussed more at the next panel. I did talk to uh, Bernardo um, in March, and and I, I asked him. He asked. Yeah, he told me that he'd like to have F-22s, F-35s. And I explained to him, well, that you know, that's maybe something that the U.S. will never really sign off on because. You know, those are very sophisticated uh, systems. And he, he was incredulous that, look, look what our pilots have done uh, so far in the old Soviet systems that they have. So uh, they, he felt confident. So we're going to be watching this. This is something that we're going to be following. Um, and then we'll be writing about this more in the war zone. And I turn it over to the ambassador. Thank you very much for going into the details of the weapons issue. Uh, we now have, um, I hope, on the screen, uh, either Ben Hodges or Anzi Zaharniuk. Uh, to address, oh, I see, I see both of them. Great. Uh, I've worked with them a lot over the past years. Uh, as many people a year ago were expecting Ukraine's imminent defeat, they were explaining why, in fact, there was no way in hell Putin would be able to take Kiev. You have to wonder why the American intelligence agencies, which so brilliantly figured out what the Russians were going to do, had no clue what Ben and Andre were saying for months and months. We'll put that to the side and come back to that later. But um, Andre, let's have a Ukrainian voice here, and then we'll go to you, Ben. By the way, I saw Andre in Kiev last week. Please. Yes, yes, we have seen each other last week. That's absolutely true. Um, it was great pleasure, as always, and great pleasure to be with you uh, today. Thank you for inviting. It's a uh, not the first time I'm participating in this uh, in this conference, and uh, it's always too great to see so many Ukraine friends of Ukraine and uh, friends which been with us through all the hardships and difficult times, and uh, always believe that uh, we'll win uh, and uh, you know and help help in all in all respects. So um, that's why I'm not going to go through a very general discussions here about like Ukrainian capabilities because you all here uh at least those who I see in the, in a guest list they all, you all understand exactly what's happening where Ukraine is participated in many different uh, conversations discussions and uh, read lots of papers and articles so I'll go through some very specific things uh so you know something very practical um Generally speaking, uh, I can say that uh, uh, Russia is trying to win the war on resources. They are understanding that the Blitzkrieg operation didn't work out. They are uh, attempts to focus on some specific regions and win there uh, didn't work out back in uh, April, May, June, July, August. Uh, then they wanted to kind of move this into more of a war of attrition game, which they lost due to the uh, to the Kharkiv and uh, Kherson counteroffensives, and um, and so they 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 are preparing for the long game. We do have understanding that they are uh, ramping up their uh, military production. We do understand that they are trying to build new factories, particularly, for instance, they are well, they are actively discussing the building the factory for the drones, Shahid drones with Iran. Uh, they're looking at modernizing their weapons. They're looking at producing more um, ammunition and so on. So basically, these uh, Russians are trying to build up a, a, an, opp an opportunity to outweigh Ukraine in, the, in, in, in this war. Uh, they are funding a lot of special information operations uh, around the world, uh, paying a lot of attention to generally to the information warfare and propaganda. And I believe that they are doing this in all areas. Um, sometimes we see very strange things happening. Sometimes we see very strange messages in the information space. Uh, we cannot say that they are all Russian or, or they actually are Russian, but uh, sometimes they are, you know, it's very weird. For example, 
in uh, European capitals, in on Sunday, there's been a multi-thousand people demonstrations, uh, including in Berlin, including in London, uh, of people who are uh, protesting for peace. Uh, but uh, they they were all wearing peace signs and they were all uh, like crying for peace and for stopping of the war. At the same time, they were uh, crying to stop NATO and stop helping Ukraine. And they were calling for the immediate negotiations, stop any resistance, and basically resist a Russian invasion without uh, without arms and without uh, any any violent response, as they call it. Um, I don't know why these guys didn't go to the uh, Russian embassies and they didn't uh, protest there because they chosen to protest in the central in the center of the cities. Um, but uh, that was really strange. Uh, in, in any case, um, there's a lot of. Um, discussions about whether ukraine has potential to win now where well, how ukraine is uh is doing during this period of time uh while there's been a, a, a some a, some people call it a stalemate which i don't agree with some people uh some some people try to qualify but everybody knows that russia was trying to prepare the new invasion which was supposed to happen now and which technically is happening uh, sorry a new offensive operation which is technically they try to do now but without much of any dramatic success. And uh, uh, of course, a lot of people talking about the upcoming uh, springtime uh, counteroffensive from Ukraine. So in the in 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 terms of the um, in terms of the uh, ground forces of Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian armed forces, we can say that, of course, there's been a massive ramp up in capabilities. We're expecting a lot of new equipment coming to Ukraine. Uh, there's a lot of commission, commitments from the European countries, as you all know about the tanks uh, and so on. So I would say right now there, se there are several big uh, issues to look at, and that's what I would like to focus on. So the issue number one would be ammunition. I think unless we look at the uh, ammunition production, and uh, I think unless we look at the uh, ramping up ammunition, seriously looking at the ammunition production around the world, we're going to have a severe shortage this year. And uh, the, I don't see so far any substantial movements on this yet. And I think that this we need to look at that collectively and uh, and do something about that. The second thing is I think that we need to look at the uh, ser seriously about the sustainment of the capabilities which are provided to Ukraine, because the track record of the uh, um, documentation and the basically the general support to which comes to Ukraine with the equipment which we receive is uh, so far uh, to be honest, there is some room for improvement, and there is from, room for improvement from Ukrainian side. Uh, we do a lot of steps on that, but uh, but uh, I believe that sustainment is something which we um, where we could do could have done much better. And since we have, we're going to have way more equipment coming soon, unless there are some sustain, substantial changes in the way how do we uh, approach that. I think we may have uh, also some troubles. Um, for instance, I believe that, uh, and that leads me to the uh, third uh, part, I think we, we need to look at the uh, new industrial policy, both for Ukraine and for the um, and for the partners. I think we need to ramp up Ukrainian industry so it can produce spares, so it can produce components for the for the equipment. Uh, we need to look at the uh, way how to help the uh, facilities, uh, government, private, whatever. In order to uh, be to participate more in this uh, in 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 uh, providing armed forces with the with the necessary means, I believe that we have uh, extremely uh, high potential for that. Uh, there's lots of good technical people, qualified engineers in the country. There's lots of good mechanics. There's lots of good electrics. There are lots of like things which Ukraine can do in house in home, and so that it can help ramp up the uh, number of weapons at home and also ramp up the um, sustainment efforts and so on. And I think the potential there, we didn't even yet to start started to explore. So I think that we're in the very, very beginning of the uh, of the of the basically course of exploring that. And it's difficult to do because indeed Ukrainian uh, industry didn't have much international experience. Uh, and uh, indeed, the, uh, particularly military industry, they always were a bit uh, isolated. And uh, I, I think that uh, the just uh, generally from a kind of a technical collaboration, uh, the you know they have some you know lots of lessons to learn. But I have to say that years ago we had exactly the same situation with Ukrainian army, uh, which was uh, just learning how to deal with Western armies. 
uh, and it learned very fast. And uh, you know, there are lots of uh, weapons which Ukraine has uh, um, uh, learned how to work with. Uh, Ukrainian armed forces learned in a, in a in a very very impressively like short period of time. And uh, I think that this is it's exactly the same potential which we have in uh, in the technical field, in the field of the support, in the field of the uh, manufacturing and uh, fabrication, production, etc. So I think that uh, we should not underestimate the potential of engineering, uh, like engineering um, people, uh, technical people, and so on. I believe that to look at that and have a strategy in that regard, and uh, basically a policy in this regard, uh, would uh, change uh, uh, Ukrainian potential very substantially. Thank you. Andrei, thank you. Ben, over to you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, I have to commend you on your haircut, by the way. Uh, you look like you're ready for airborne school. I mean, that's a, a really <laughs> a sharp, sharp haircut for one of our leading diplomats. I don't think they'd have me, but thank you. <laughs> so um, everybody that's listening today, you know, we, we all agree on so many of the main issues that are out there. And Howard did an excellent job, as you would expect, laying out certain things. And then Andre, who I've enjoyed um, doing this with for quite some time, um, provided excellent uh, insight. So I want to just address three sort of areas uh, and then look forward to the follow-on discussion. It is so important that we stop saying this is the one-year anniversary of the war. It is important to keep in mind that this started in 2014. Uh, this is not a, 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 a issue of just uh, semantics. The, the reason it's important to keep in mind that this, this war started in 2014 is because number one, it gave that's what gave Russia control over Crimea. And Crimea is the decisive terrain for this entire war. So it's Russian control of Crimea that has enabled them to wreck Ukraine's economy by blocking access in and out of Azov Sea, and to disrupt what's going on in the uh, with Odessa, and gives them the flexibility to control Ukraine's Black Sea coastline. So, this what happened back in 2014 is important from that standpoint. But it also, even more importantly, I think, it shows what failed deterrence looks like. I mean, Russia took Crimea, and then they entered Donbas, uh, helping the so-called separatists. And we basically did nothing. And of course, this came on the heels of them invading Georgia when we basically did nothing. And so when you if you put yourself in the Kremlin and you start thinking, OK, let's go ahead and finish the job and get all of Ukraine, uh, destroy Ukraine as a state. Um, we know the West is not really going to do anything. I mean, Germany is still building Nord Stream 2. The United States is reeling from Afghanistan. The UK domestically is a mess. And. Uh, Ukraine has not even started really increasing ammunition production in the seven, eight years since then. So they probably uh, won't really fight back. Uh, and so failed deterrence emboldened the Russians to launch the special military operation last February. And so I think that for me is such an important takeaway from this that failed deterrence leads to, I mean, we know from thousands of years of history, this is what happens when you don't show that you are prepared to do everything necessary to defend what you care about. And I think I also wanted to emphasize this point because there are an awful lot of people right there in Washington, D.C., as well as in Berlin and other places that are wringing their hands that, oh, my God, Russia is, is still going to win, that there's no way Ukraine can win. After eight years, now almost nine years, Russia controls less than 20% of Ukraine, despite having every advantage. And, and it's not getting any better for Russia. It's not going to get any better for Russia. So we've got to disabuse ourselves of the idea that Ukraine cannot defeat, because I think this causes us to deter ourselves. Uh, I, I think everybody that's listening already gets this. But, but I think we've got to continue to pound away on the, the fairy tale that Russia just can't be defeated because it, clearly it's not true. The second point that has already been made, but I think it's got to be continued to be made because the administration 
still has not come around to the importance, the essential nature of identifying what is our strategic aim. What are we trying to do? Without clarity on what it is we're trying to do, we will forever um, have, uh, we will forever waste time about what's the best tank to send or whether or not to provide a F-16 or a particular other kind of platform. And then you'll have leaders saying empty things like, we're in it for as long as it takes without ever specifying what it is. Um, or they'll say things like, this is going to be a long war. It doesn't have to be. It could be over this year. If the United States decided that we want Ukraine to win, I mean, this is the United States. The, the combined GDPs of the U.S. and the EU is about 20 times what Russia has. So this does not have to be a long war. It's up to us, but we have to have the clarity. The third and final thing I would I would mention is the uh, essential nature of, or the strategic decisive nature of Crimea. And it's because of economic reasons. Uh, at Munich Security Conference, I spoke with a very, very, very senior director of a one of the three largest international investment firms on the planet. And he said, there will be no investment in a Marshall Plan. There will be no investment in Ukraine if there is no ironclad security guarantee. So without security, there's no investment. And, and if there's no investment, then that means 4 million plus Ukrainian refugees are gonna to continue to live in Germany and Poland and the Netherlands and everywhere else because they have nothing to which they can go back to. If Russia continues to control Crimea, there will be no security for Ukraine. And Russia's control of Crimea enables them to continue blocking access in and out of Azov Sea. So even if Mariupol and Verdansk were liberated, they would not be able to revitalize. They would not be able to do anything. Ukraine's economy depends on export of grain and rare earth materials, iron ore. That'll be impossible as long as Russia sits there on the Crimean Peninsula. So we have got to uh, push back on the idea that Crimea is, is, negotiate, is negotiable. And there are too many skeptics out there that say, there's no way, come on, there's no way they're going to um, capture or liberate Crimea. That, that could be done by the end of this summer. If you think in an innovative way, not the linear way, which, which is happening over there across the Potomac. It, instead, think in terms of long range precision capabilities that enable Ukraine to isolate the peninsula and then to uh, make it untenable for Russian forces. Don't think in terms of large scale infantry attacks. Um, instead, think in terms of how do you isolate the peninsula using precision and then um, the Russian Black Sea Fleet can't sit there in Sevastopol as long as you've got uh, ATACMs or drones or small small diameter bombs or whatever it is raining down uh, on the facilities necessary for the Black Sea Fleet or the air base at Saki or the logistics hub at Jankoy. Sakir said precision can defeat mass if you have enough time. We've got time. We've got about three months before it's time for Ukraine's uh, land forces to launch their counterstrike in the direction of Azov Sea. Let's use those three months to start making the Crimean Peninsula untenable. I can't tell. There's a young man holding up a sign with numbers, and I don't know if that meant that was my score. And I went from 15 <laughs> to eight. I mean, it was getting worse uh, with each uh, with each passing minute. So I, that's why I stopped. Okay, you you going to stop here, Ben? Okay, thank you. All right, we've had three excellent presentations. Um, you answered the question I was about to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway, so uh, the audience hears it in response to the question. Uh, you said, and I think you kind of described, and I'd like to do, more, do this in more detail, what the United States needs to do so that Ukraine can win the war this year. Is that to me, John? So you, so you, Ben, and we'll let Andrew jump into it also, let our jump in as well, because this is, I think, a very important question. Okay, well, the, the first thing we have to do is we have to decide that we want Ukraine to win. I mean, that's that seems like a simple thing, but the administration, which has done such a fantastic job on so many other aspects of this, has not said our desired end state is that Ukraine 
wins, which means that Ukraine restores full uh, sovereignty over all of its territory, gets the thousands of young Ukrainians uh, that were deported back into Ukraine, and that the and we uh, accountability uh, for war crimes, and then there's some sort of security guarantee that will enable or allow uh, reconstruction to move forward. So we have to decide that they're going to win, and then that means you give the capability. Uh, I, I think we waste too much time talking about specific weapons. Instead, talk about capabilities, what's required to liberate Crimea. Donbass is important. It's not strategic. We could liberate all of Donbass right now, and that would not change the outcome. Liberate Crimea, you change the outcome. Okay, thank you. Andre? Uh, you're muted. You, I don't know. Andre, um, you're muted. I seen, yeah, fixed. Um, thank you. I certainly agree, and uh, I also would like to stress that uh, even after Munich, for example, or some other areas, it's very, very clear that there is uh, uh, constant reluctance to talk about victory uh, for in, in many, many politicians. So they avoid that word as if, uh, as if by saying that, you know, they take some kind of a responsibility for it. Uh, we cannot uh, we cannot do it like this without understanding the uh, of the outcome. We need to be having a very clear plan, a strategic plan, and then on operational level there must be campaign plans, which we can discuss. And then campaign plans may have the uh, you know the resources requirements, which would include weapons and military systems and capabilities and so on. So we're not like imagining anything new, but. Um, but we constantly hear that uh, from many politicians uh, on different platforms that Ukraine needs to um, perform as uh, at its best so it can have a better uh, seat at negotiation table. I don't know who this negotiation will be with, but clearly not with Putin. I don't think he, I mean, we're all clear that he's incapable to, to do anything. Also, I don't think he will nego he, he will be negotiating, you know, him being a convicted criminal and uh, all, all other things which he already earned himself. So, um, but but seriously, there's a constant avoidance of uh, mentioning victory and discussing the format of the victory. I think we should stop being afraid of uh, victory. Uh, and because it, it's very difficult to, um, to 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 fund it, to source it, to sort of resource it, if uh, on political level people are, uh, are reluctant even to admit that we are here after victory. And that's not just in the United States, that's in many countries. Even Macron, I don't know if that's any kind of a argument, but even President Macron is talking about victory right now in his posts. So he was always about negotiations and so on. But if you read of his latest uh, speeches and latest uh, recent posts, he's, he, he finally adopted that. So I suggest for those politicians who haven't yet adopted that, like follow Macron's lead, whatever, whatever, if, if, if that helps. But seriously, I mean, we need to be very decisive on this. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Howard. Well, as a journalist, far be it for me to offer any advice or uh, opinion. Just when I talk to military commanders and politicians, it's always a good idea to, to have an end game in mind, know what the end state is uh, before you go into things. Um, the U.S. has not always been great at that, as we've seen. Uh, ben and I've had a number of discussions about um, the importance of Crimea and, and how uh, an attack would take place. Um, they don't share, unfortunately, the campaign plans with me. But the the Gord had just talked about um, an effort to uh, hit the land bridge, um, either down through Mariupol or Melitopol. Um, to do that, you need you know combined arms as uh, some of these new capabilities that the U.S. is providing and, and allies are providing the the Bradleys, particularly the Beefist, uh, which is a fires support platform. Um, the the strikers the, the martyrs uh, all these will help um ukraine and its its maneuver capabilities um something that the russians have not been able to do um and so that in the next few months you'll see how that unfolds uh but again knowing what the end state is is always is always an important thing okay thank you um we'll turn to the floor for questions but before that, I'm going to abuse my control of the mic to offer the following observation. Uh, we heard in the first session, which was excellent, um, from a friend of Ukraine, Congressman Higgins, but importantly, 
a Democrat friend of Ukraine, and I'll explain why that's that's significant here. Uh, he was asked about weapon supply, and uh, his answer was essentially well, he's asked about the administration's aims in this war and weapon supply, and he said things which were music, partly music to the ear of an audience that believes strongly in a Ukrainian victory. He says he thinks well, as long as it takes means as long as it takes to victory, when in fact that's not what it means. And he also offered excuses for why you, the United States is not providing some of the West, West weapon systems that Ukraine is requesting. The uh, DCM mentioned those systems, and Ben and Andre have been strongly pushing for this uh, publicly. The answer to the question is why they don't do this is a certain timidity on the part of the administration because they are, they believe that Putin might in fact use nuclear weapons. And it's smart, prudent for senior American officials to concern themselves with this possibility, but not publicly and not as an excuse to avoid serious action which American interests require. And so that is a problem which is very much uh, in the forefront. And the fact that the administration has repeatedly said publicly, it cannot do X or Y because Putin might escalate. A, that's not how we have ever behaved as a nuclear power in the past, in going toe to toe with the Soviets over Berlin twice and Cuba once. And that has encouraged Putin to use the nuclear threat even more often. Now, just for your consideration as to why I think this is a bluff as opposed to a true threat, most importantly is Russian behavior. They have thrown the nuclear card, A, in connection with defensive Crimea, and of course, Ukrainian forces have struck Crimea numerous and very effectively, numerous times effectively without that red line being activated. Ditto with the four oblasts, which Russia quote unquote annexed in September. Ditto with Sweden and Finland joining NATO. Let me submit for your consideration that Putin is pretty good at psychology. That's one trait he has. And the, he and the Russian state have elaborated the rat in the corner metaphor for over 20 years to frighten us. And sadly, a lot of people have fallen for it. Last point, I'm just giving you talking points when you account to this. Uh, a retired Russian general, Yevgeny Bushinsky, Bushinsky on you know, Russian propaganda TV, while his fellow guests were fulminating about nuking London and nuking Paris, said, you know, don't be stupid. We would only use nukes, in fact, if NATO attacked us and not Russian territory, quote unquote, Ukrainian, quote unquote, Russian territory, meaning Russian territory. And also Dmitry Trenin, a former FSB officer, wrote an article about two months ago saying that Putin's relied on two big cards which have failed him in this war. One was the hydrocarbon cut off to Europe and two was the nuclear threat because everybody knows this is just a bluff. Okay, my lecture is over except for one more point. The administration has become truly expert at finding excuses to hide its concern about nuclear uh, war and to give us other reasons why they're not sending the weapons. A, Ukrainians take time to train up on this stuff. The Ukrainians trained on HIMARS in two weeks, two and a half weeks, whereas we give our own guys four weeks to do HIMARS, and they use them brilliantly. Ukraine has other absorptive capacity problems. No, Ukraine can't use the weapons effectively. I heard that in the fight about javelins eight years ago. We heard it again with the HIMARS, no. Then my favorite is the administration sends talking points to generals and then say the generals don't want them to have it. I know that for a fact, and I will not say which general, but we know this for a fact. The point is, we've been timid because we're timid, and that is not a good look for a superpower. Okay, the, the lecture is over. I know James wants to ask a question, and I will be quiet and just direct the conversation henceforth. Yes.
Um, thank you. The, apart from the fear of victory, which Andre has dwelt upon, I have dwelt upon it elsewhere, there is another fear at high levels, which is the fear of clarity. We have an entire elite of people in the United States and in many West, other Western countries who are experts in, saying, in not saying what they mean exactly. Um, and I want to relate that to the specific issue that General Hodges raised about Crimea. The administration has said countless times, we will not supply Ukraine with weapons that have the range to strike Russian territory. But it's quite clear they're very reticent about supplying them with weaponry that has the, has the range to strike across Donbass and Crimea. Is it not time one of you popped the question, do we recognize Crimea as part of, as part of Russia? And if not, then what is your real reason for not supplying the necessary capability? Thanks. I'm gonna take that question because I asked that question of the Pentagon uh, many months ago. Um, I, I asked them, is, uh, is Crimea, is, is our targets in Crimea, particularly the Kerch Bridge, is that fair game? And the response that I got is yes. Crimea is Ukraine, and targets in Crimea are fair game. So that question was asked and answered. The, uh, the Pentagon has said that is the case. Um, what happens after that, I, I don't really know in terms of providing the long-range capabilities. It's interesting, uh, Ukraine has a number, of, uh, it appears they have a number of uh, strike capabilities, drones. We've seen the situation in Mariupol. I'd still like to find out what, what struck in Mariupol. Um, there, there was, it appears there was an, another strike behind Russian lines at, at, at some uh, fuel facility. So there are some capabilities, but, but in terms of the answer, I did ask that question because it's a very good question. Thank you. Um, Andrea, you want to jump in here too? But please unmute. Yes, yes. Uh, I just wanted to mention one thing. At the end of this war, uh, the global community will consider nuclear weapons either extremely useful or useless, completely useless. <laughs> uh, and that would depend uh, on uh, if they see, for example, that Russia can win or get something out of this, failing conventionally, but just because of its nuclear status, either by using new nuclear weapons or by using uh, nuclear deterrence, then uh, we'll see a massive wave of proliferation around the world uh, for like unlimited amount of time. Everybody will want to have nuclear. At the same time, if Russia loses without a chance to use nuclear weapons or win with nuclear weapons, then people will understand that it's a totally useless thing. Nobody will want that. So basically, which scenario the world goes, and I really don't want to us to live in the world where we have a massive proliferation, because uh, eventually if we have many, many countries owning nuclear weapons, somebody will use them one day. Um, so, so, so we need to avoid that scenario. And it all depends on the fact that if we allow, if we means the democratic community, including the United States, if we allow Russia to play with nuclear weapons as a deterrent like they do right now and, and deter, the, deter the help and, and, and everything else. So, so this is, we are, we're not just talking about the outcome for Ukraine for the next like a year or so. We're talking about for the scenario at which the world will be developing. Thank you. Thank you. Ben, you want to jump in? Yeah, very quickly. Uh, James's question is an excellent question. Um, and, and I think Howard, you know, obviously answered that, of course, uh, Ukrainians can shoot at targets on Crimea. Uh, but I spoke with a very, very, very senior DOD official in Munich that you would all know. Uh, and then with a very, very senior person on the joint staff that most of you would know. And their response to my question about Crimea was demonstrated to me that they are thinking 100% linearly that it's all about defeating Rus Russians in the Donbass. I mean, when Secretary Austin says we're going to give them what they need to push the Russians back, well, that's the exact opposite thing of what they should be trying to do. Let Ukrainian forces continue to hold the Russians up around Bakhmut. It's very costly, but that's not 
decisive savior capability for a decisive effort. And so these two people that I spoke to, one of them said, well, come on, Crimea doesn't play that big a role in the logistics for support of Russian forces in, in the southern part of Ukraine, which means that person completely misunderstands the strategic importance of Crimea. And this is a person that should know. And then the person from the joint staff said, well, we've war gamed all the scenarios. There's no way they can do it. And so because of this, they don't provide the things that are needed, which would enable Ukrainians to do it. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's why I think Ukraine has got to make the case of the uh, decisiveness of Crimea, not pushing back Russians out of Donbass. There, look, Donbass will, after, you, after Crimea is liberated, Donbass will take care of itself. There will not be a lot of enthusiasm for continuing to fight up there once Crimea is lost because of what the changes that will happen in the Kremlin. Um, I hate to tell you that I lied. <laughs> uh, regarding the question that James asked, which is an excellent question, I recommend to all of you an article that was written in Politico two Wednesday, Wednesdays ago. It's about the conversation that Secretary Blinken had with about 14 think tankers. I was on that call. Read that article. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Just to Politico two Wednesdays ago, Blinken on uh, with think tankers. You'll find it. Okay. We have a question over here and then here. And then, okay, you got the phone. Okay, I'm sorry. He's already got the microphone. Yes. And then the woman over here and then this gentleman over here, please. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ivan Vinnik. I'm from Ukraine. And basically, as a responsible citizen of Ukraine, I have no doubts about Ukrainian victory. But on the other hand, as a security and defense professional, I think there is a number of issues which have to be addressed. Please ask one question. Yes. We only have 15 minutes. Yes, of course. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, I fully support what, ha what has General Hodges just said regarding that the decision about Ukrainian victory has to be taken at a high level, including in the uh, United States. My question is very simple. What are the parameters of that victory? What does it mean? Yes, we will liberate Donbass. We will liberate Crimea. Uh, but what would restrain and prevent Putin to keep ramping up his uh, production, defense production, and keep shooting missiles against Ukraine? I'm reflecting about what General Hoja just said, uh, about economical development, about controlling the risks, about hedge funds, invest funds, and Marshall plans, and so on. Nobody will invest in Ukraine until probably Moscow is liberated from Putin, are we planning as Ukrainians together with ally, allies uh, liberate Moscow from Putin as uh, I'm recalling the heritage of Second World War, somebody liberated Berlin from Hitler. Are we planning to do something similar? Or what are the parameters of Ukrainian victory then? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, ben, you want to try that? It's a toughie. Well, I think that um, we should be thinking about what happens when Crimea is liberated. I mean, I think that that is going to unleash so much change on the Russian side. That that's what it means to say that Crimea is decisive. I mean, you could kill every Wagnerite that's in uh, within 50 miles of Bakhmut right now. That would not change the outcome. You liberate Crimea, that completely changes the, the, the calculus for everybody. And I think that um, we will see a lot less enthusiasm for continuing to support separatists in, Don in the uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, which is a huge drain on the Russians, by the way. And yes, of course, there is always going to be the possibility that Russia will launch strikes from inside Russia into, uh, into Ukraine across that long border. But I think they'll be from a much weaker position. And of course, the United States um, is going has already made it clear that we're going to continue to support and invest in Ukraine for the long haul. Okay, thank you. One over here, and then gentleman sitting next to her. Um, thank you. Good morning. My name is Katerina Odarchenko. I'm also as the one from Kherson. So we have a little Kherson coalition. I have a question about China because uh, last week we have conversation about Russian disinformation campaign, and uh, on this week so they actively use. Um, issue of like China plan uh, in uh, their media work in Europe. So uh, my question is for what time Russia and China can cooperate till what uh, milestone, you know, because from one way, 
uh, for China, it's good to have cheap resources from Russia potentially in future. And from other way, they now use actively this like China plan to propose, um, no, you know, frozen conflict or some parts uh, which will be Ukrainian part of like Russians. So what your uh, opinion about this cooperation with China? Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Yeah, we've uh, covered is there's, there's a couple levels to that. One is is the military, one is the, is the information operation. I'll talk about the information operation quick. Um, Russians have done a very good job in uh, the south of, of the Southern Hemisphere, Africa, elsewhere, in, in the information game, uh, much better than the West has done. That That's a, that's a big factor. The other question is, you know, there's a big question now whether China will arm um, Russia. As, as was mentioned before, ammunition uh, and weapons are um, uh, an issue, the, being able to, to sustain a fight. Um, it's unclear right now whether China will. There's been some discussion whether they're going to provide drones to, to um uh, uh, Russia. Um, the administration, President Biden, has talked about san additional sanctions on China. What what can the U.S. really do uh, other than sanctions? Probably, n I don't know. Um, so there's, but I, I think that the, the longstanding relationship between China and Russia is there's been tension. Um, so I don't know how much I think, and I think also China would like to see uh, the U.S. drain itself. That big balloon that, that tra traversed the U.S. was a reminder that there's, you know, another uh, potential conflict over the horizon, which has got people in the U.S. thinking about, well, we need to, you know, think about what happens if they invade uh, Taiwan in 2027, which is maybe putting a crimp on what some of the uh, provision of U.S. supplies might be. So, um, yeah, there are concerns about China, um, and I think we're still investigating what those are. I don't know if I answered that question for you. Thank you. Andre, you want to jump in? Andre? Uh, all right, Ben, you want to talk about this as well? Uh, I think Howard covered it. Just, you know, China's watching to see if we have the resolve. Right. I mean, if we can't stick together and, and help Ukraine defeat Russia, then I don't think they're going to be too impressed with anything we see about South China Sea or, or Taiwan. Thank you. Okay. Gentlemen over here. Yeah, I'd like to uh, uh, address the question of the strategic value of Crimea for Ukraine uh, and Russia. For, for Russia, it has strategic value. It has a lot of uh, emotional content for them. Uh, and uh, connecting uh, Donbass, uh, Russia, Donbass to Crimea was, was one of the primary objectives, the, the land bridge. If you take Crimea out of the equation for Russia, it becomes a bridge to nowhere, to put it in a context of something Americans can understand. Southern Ukraine becomes a bridge to nowhere for the Russians. And if you look at a map, there are not that many strategically important elements of that part of Ukraine to the Russians, other than the, the control that it gives them on the Ukraine's economy. So Crimea is absolutely the number one goal for Ukraine. The rest of it starts to fall apart. Okay, um, Ben, you wanna comment on that? Hey, he said it better than I could. <laughs> Is that you don't? Oh, good. Okay. Ben, you want to jump in? You want to take that? Okay. Andre, you ready to answer that? Yeah, guys, sorry. We had the air alarm just now. So I needed to uh, in Kiev. I'm in oh, Kiev. Stood. Can you please repeat the question, if you can, quickly, because I needed to step out to kind of close this alarm off. Uh, the, the, he stressed the, the importance of Crimea for Ukraine. It's important for Russia, but if Ukraine takes it, then Russia's presence in eastern and southern Ukraine is a bridge to nowhere. Uh, well, obviously, I mean, as you know, Crimea is not just uh, land, it's also uh, uh, control over the uh, uh, total, like a northern part of the Black Sea, Sea of Azov. Uh, obviously, that's a platform for invasion. Crimea was turned into the massive military base right now. Uh, it's the essentially from a geostrategic and military perspective, uh, uh, it's a constant threat uh, for Ukraine. Uh, there's, uh, I fully agree with Ben. I repeated his words like I don't know how many times. 
already in all platforms imaginable that uh, Ukraine is not going to be successful economically and not going to be secure unless the Crimea coming is coming back. So, uh, you know, we should, uh, uh, on, a, on a sort of political level, we should have zero uh, compromise on that point uh, because there, there's a lot of people who try to push us into something like, okay, let's liberate Ukraine, but let's keep Crimea. Also, Crimea is a symbol of Russian imperialism. There's a, it's a, it's a symbol of the fact that they keep uh, keep it as a as a part of their imperialistic sort of expansion. Um, if uh, Russia keeps imperialistic policy, which means that it's an enemy for Ukraine because they will keep on trying to fight against Ukraine, then it's a threat, and we need to deal this with this as a threat. If Russia suddenly, which I honestly don't believe it's going to happen in uh, soon, becomes a, like a civilized democratic nation without a threat to other uh, other people, other other nations, then it has no right to talk about keeping Crimea anyway. So in all circumstances, Russia can justify uh, Crimea, and in all circumstances, we should be weak in our communications with international governments and just say, well, Crimea is a kind of a special status. No. Um, so, and whether it's done, it could be done physically, the return of Crimea, absolutely. And uh, Ben spent a great deal of time explaining how exactly it's going to happen, and I fully agree. Um, if somebody is interested, we uh, can read the paper, uh, article in the Foreign Affairs about that. There's a six pages of detailed uh, exp explanation of strategy on Crimea and on the victory, by the, by the way. Uh, and that's it. So there's no, comp there shouldn't be any compromise. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Steve Blank over here, question, and then a question in the back, and then I'll probably wrap it up. Mike? It's coming it's up here. Thank you. Uh, this is more in the way of an analysis than a question. Uh, I agree. Steve, completely, two minutes. I, I completely agree with my friend Ben uh, Ben Hodges about this. But there's a larger dimension. To the extent that the Ukrainians can regain Crimea, they one break the blockade. So the, the second, the land forces in Donbas, particularly the southern part, become unsustainable. So from a tactical, operational, and strategic point, Ukraine gains immense strength, and Russia's forces are at immense risk to a degree they haven't been. Second, control of the Black Sea is essential to end the blockade, not only because of Ukraine, but because of what Russia is doing with regard to grain and energy. Third, if you look at what they're doing with energy in conjunction with the use of force, information warfare, cyber, all the elements of the Russian hybrid war, they are attempting to undermine the Balkans as well. What happened in Moldova and what's happening in Serbia are not accidents. They are part of Russian war strategy, and they're not just diplomatic issues in foreign policy. To the extent that the Crimea is lost to Russia, you have liberated the Balkans from, an, from many threats connected with the use of force and energy, because the, other one, the energy and information in cyber don't work if force is not there. So if anything, the liberation of Crimea is to use a nice Marxist term, a principle that is overdetermined. Thank you. Very smart observation. Anyone want to comment on it? Andre? Sorry, I full, fully agree. Yes, it's a uh, hundred percent. And uh, by the way, one more thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I fully agree that it's difficult to talk about the prolonging peace if Putin stays in power and we don't have the resources and I don't think anybody seriously will commit into taking him out from uh, Moscow, etc. But if he uh, one thing that all dictators are afraid is to we look weak and basically lose power through the weakness. If he has a sort of loser uh, kind of a label on him, I mean, they will probably take care about that themselves. The only way to do that for sure is to take back Crimea. So I, I think that uh, relation, I mean, serious, like relationship between losing Crimea and Putin losing and Russia losing Putin, so to speak, you know, is, is very directly related. That's why he's so, you know, he's so adamant on Crimea, but we certainly shouldn't be deterred of that. Thank you. Thank you. Last question over here. Sure. Um, my question uh, hovers around, uh, in terms of the land needs for the uh, Ukrainian military, hovers around conservation of manpower and the evacuation system. Uh, being a former medic, uh, uh, it's sort of uh, it's close to home for me. So uh, there was a video recently from, uh, from Solidar of a 113 evacuating and dodging artillery rounds, evacuating uh, wounded uh, Ukrainian soldier out of Solidar. Uh, 
The armored capabilities, uh, we received a letter from the Minister of Health of Ukraine, Yashko, in terms of 200 uh, armored ambulances required. The critical care transport system uh, in terms of evacuating civilians and military from a lot of these uh, hot zones uh, has also been compromised and they're requesting over 500 critical care transport ambulances that's the random mobility type C and another and another uh, uh, 200 uh, four by four ambulances to evacuate people because of destroyed roads so they can ford streams and such to evacuate people. Perhaps you could comment on that and perhaps highlight uh, where the critical uh, the critical need is at present. So we as the diaspora can coordinate and help out. Thank you. Andre, I think it's yours. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, Ukraine does have a, sorry, just a second. This is. Yes, I'm sorry. It was uh, uh, again about this error alarm. alarm. So um, the, uh, uh, I, I fully trust our medical command. They exactly know what's needed. So if they if they send a message about the needed equipment, we 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 completely support it. Uh, Ukraine probably has over years. I was in uh, uh, myself dealing with lots of evacuation efforts uh, over the last uh, nine years, and uh, of course, evacu evacuation personnel of Ukrainian armed forces is one of the most experienced, particularly in that terrain, particularly in those areas because it does have uh, some um, differences. But I have to say that um, I just recently been in one of the NATO countries myself, and I've been on a military base on a completely different uh, issue. And, the, and, the, and the, 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 uh, the commander of the base had shown me 600 vehicles, which are currently staying. Uh, and I cannot say which country, uh, but uh, they were not used. They were perfectly capable for carrying the wounded soldiers. They, were, uh, they had light armor. Uh, they were for all road use, and they were in a quite good condition. And they said that they were totally written off. And this was just one base, one country, uh, and they were free, so to speak, because they were written off already. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a access uh, articles. Um, I, I was told by many friends in various NATO armies who I have over the, I mean, over the years that there are bases like that more and more around the, around Europe and around uh, North America. I don't know why getting 500 vehicles is such an issue, to be honest. Uh, so particularly since we're talking about uh, something quite basic. Um, so I think that it's a resolvable thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's achievable. And uh, if anybody on political level can help to achieve that, that would be extremely appreciated. Thank you. Just uh, quickly, the U.S. in its $32 billion of uh, aid has provided 100 armored medical treatment vehicles um, to, to Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, no, we're time is up. Um, we can ask the questions maybe in, in the corridors. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for a great discussion. You had some of the best minds on this issue for you this morning. And Walter, thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before uh, uh, General Hodges and, uh, and, and Andrew and sign off, I just wanted to say to all of you, uh, that uh, this panel it was exactly what I thought it would get it off to the best possible start. And I actually wanted to compliment it. I had to cut my opening remarks short, um, but I wanted to say it was General Hodges and General Breedlove and Ambassador Volker and you, Ambassador Herbst, that were saying nine months after the war began that, Jesus, this guy just is not armed to be able to take anything. The General Hodges said, to take Kiev would take 300,000, and, uh, and they only brought 190,000 to this night fight. So he said that in January of last year. <laughs> exactly right. Great. Yes, <laughs> exactly right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And I'm going to give a five minute coffee break um, as, as it was put, but I mean a five minute coffee break and not a two hour coffee break. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you, General. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.